This podcast includes discussion of rape and sexual assault, abuse, murder, and other criminal behavior. Listener discretion is advised. Clearfield Police Detective Bill Holthouse had a search warrant for Doug Lovell's Mazda RX-7. The car sat in an impound lot, where it had been for four days, ever since Bill had pulled Doug out of it and arrested him for the rape of Joyce Yost. Bill suspected he might find a gun in the car, or possibly blood stains. He came up empty on both fronts. He did, however, locate six capsules containing an unidentified white powder. That wasn't all. But in the process of doing the car, we noticed the VIN number. A car's VIN number is a unique identifier, like a serial number. Any police officer will tell you there's more than one VIN on a car. So uh, the other officer crawled up underneath and found the chassis VIN. It didn't match. The car had two different VIN numbers. Bill ran both through NCIC, the FBI's national crime database. The chassis VIN came back as stolen. Doug Lovell's little red Mazda was hot. This is Cold, Season 2, Episode 3, Nightmare on Top of a Nightmare. From KSL Podcasts, I'm Dave Cauley. We'll be right back. Bill Holthouse had some questions for Doug Lovell about his Mazda. We had impounded his car, of course, I should say that. Like, why did it have two different VIN numbers? He confronted Doug a few hours after making that discovery. According to police reports, Doug claimed a few months earlier he'd gone to a business in Ogden called Lincoln Auto, looking to buy an RX-7. Lincoln Auto had connected him with a guy named Marvin Flukiger, who ran a shop called Body Beauty in the city of Logan. Flukiker had a blue RX-7 on his lot. The body was damaged beyond repair, but the frame and engine were still good. Doug told Bill he had initially planned to convert the wreck into a sand rail or dune buggy. He had obtained a loan for the car through America First Credit Union. You have already heard part of this story from Susan, the loan officer. It was to purchase an 82 Mazda RX-7, and he wanted the check made out to this Marvin Flukender. I have a copy of this check, which includes both Doug and Marvin's names. Doug told Bill he paid Marvin to tow the wreck to a storage unit where he planned to do the conversion. Sometime later, Doug said he had been shooting pool at a hole-in-the-wall bar and pizza joint called the Circle Inn when he met a mechanic. This guy, Doug said, had offered to restore the wrecked Mazda for the low, low price of three grand. Doug gave this guy the keys to his storage unit and, two weeks later, went to claim his prize. The car, which had been blue, was now red. To make a long story short on that, the car was stolen. As for the swapped VIN number, well, Doug didn't know anything about that. We found out later that he was partially involved in a stolen car ring. I will go deeper into this in just a bit. First, let's talk about how Doug had managed to get out of jail. Following his arrest on suspicion of rape, Doug had told his family, as well as his wife Rhonda, it was a misunderstanding. Doug would later say his father told him something along the lines of, no son of mine could commit rape. Doug didn't have the money to post bail himself. He convinced his dad to do it for him. If Doug were to run, his dad would be stuck paying the full $25,000. But Doug had no intention of running. Doug returned to the Ogden main branch of America First Credit Union after getting out of jail. He needed to talk to his friend, Susan, because he no longer had the car on which he was supposed to be making payments. And so I explained to him the normal situation when a car's impounded, they notify the lien holder and then we go pick up the car. So I explained all that to him. This raised the question, why had police impounded the car? Doug told Susan he had been hustled by a woman. 
he had gone to the woman's apartment and spent the night with her. She was begging him not to leave. And that he finally left, went home to his apartment, got cleaned up, and was going to work, and the police picked him up on the highway. Doug told Susan the woman with whom he had slept was now making a phony accusation of rape. And he did tell me all about she was going to prosecute me for rape. And he asked me what, what he should do. And I told him he needed to get a good attorney. Doug had a different idea. He explained he had separated from his wife, Rhonda. You know, he acted like he needed someone to talk to and asked me if he, you know, we could go have a cup of coffee or go to lunch. Susan felt no desire to interact with Doug in any kind of social setting. She told him no. Doug had other friends with whom to speak. One of them, named William Wiswell, who was better known by his street name Billy Jack, was living in Grand Junction, Colorado. That's where he was when, in late April of 1985, he received a phone call. Doug told Billy Jack he had a job for him, and Billy Jack said he was game. Doug made the five-hour drive to Grand Junction that same day. Doug had first met William while in the Utah State Prison five years earlier. Billy Jack wasn't a big man, only standing about five foot three. But he found Doug's Ford pickup truck quite cramped as he slid onto the bench seat. He had to share the space not only with Doug, but also Rhonda and her little daughter Alicia. Bill Holthouse told me Doug and Rhonda had been estranged at the time of the rape. He was at that time separated from his wife. He was living in the house there down there in Clearfield. She was living up in the apartment in South Ogden. But they had reconciled since. Rhonda had rented a place at the Lake Park Apartments, less than a mile and a half as the crow flies from Joyce Yost's apartment in South Ogden. Doug abandoned his house in Clearfield and moved in with Rhonda there. That is where he was taking Billy Jack. They didn't talk much, on this long drive. Doug only talked about the job after Alicia had dozed off, saying he would pay $5,000 for Billy Jack to kill Joyce Yost. Bill Holthouse kept in touch with Joyce in the days and weeks following the rape. I had uh, two or three telephone conversations with her. And uh, once I went to her apartment and spoke with her, and uh, one time she came into the office. She provided hair and blood samples for the crime lab during that office visit on May 9th, 1985. Joyce's ex-husband, Mel Roberts, told me she had discussed the rape with him as well. And it had a tremendous emotional effect on her. Mel had encouraged Joyce to move forward with criminal charges. She did while also trying to shield her daughter and son from the details. She didn't let it define her. But I know, I, I can't imagine as a woman not letting that eat you alive inside. Bill, meantime, kept busy chasing down leads. He'd learned Doug's Mazda, had disappeared from a dealership called Carlson Cadillac in Salt Lake City in May of 84. That case was still open and assigned to a Salt Lake City police detective named Ron Greenleaf. It was my case to follow up on because it was on automobile, like we call the dealer row. Bill told Ron he was investigating a rape. The uh, suspect was Douglas Lovell and that he was in this red vehicle which was stolen. Ron headed up to Clearfield to take a look at the Mazda. There's 17 digits in a, in a VIN number, and every one of them means something. Like where and when the car was built, what type of engine it came with, and even what color it had been painted at the factory. Ron brought a large book he called the S-VIN Bible. It contained the codes auto manufacturers used to generate VIN numbers, as well as the locations of secret VINs. We confirmed that definitely that was the car. No doubt about it. 
The detectives next turned their attention to Lincoln Auto. Lincoln Auto is where he got the salvage bin. Ron told me he and many other Utah detectives who investigated car thefts back in the 80s harbored suspicions about Lincoln Auto. Because they would go out of state and you'd always see them on the freeway with car carriers taking damaged vehicles back. And generally, they were always high-end vehicles. Those wrecked cars would then sit on the Lincoln lot. Why would a junkyard in Ogden, Utah be accumulating high-end vehicles? Ron leaned on the folks at Lincoln Auto and learned Doug Lovell had been involved in the transfer of another salvaged vehicle. There's also a pickup truck that was involved. It was off another lot. A white 1985 Toyota SR5 pickup truck stolen from Dan's used cars in Salt Lake City in October of 84. This was another of Ron Greenleaf's open cases. Like the Mazda, the Toyota had gone through Marvin Flukiker's shop, Body Beauty, before receiving a new salvage title from Lincoln Auto. The detectives tracked down the Toyota and discovered it, too, had a mismatched VIN. Somebody, we didn't know if it was him, we presumed it was him, that switched the uh, dash VIN number, the VIN number on the dash. I have to be careful here, as Marvin Flugiker was never arrested or charged with any crime related to these vehicles, nor were the owners of Lincoln Auto. But investigators did not believe Doug had acted alone. The way they did it was they would go drive the car from a used car lot to test it. While they had it, they'd get copies of the keys made. They would come back later and steal the car. And that's how they got the cars. Stolen cars are tough to register, since they can be traced by their VIN numbers. A moment ago, Ron posed a rhetorical question about why a junkyard would want to stockpile fancy but smashed up cars. One reason could be if they were running what's known as a salvage switch or VIN swap scam. In that case, a thief would go to the junkyard seeking something very specific. I would tell you all I want is the vehicle identification numbers, the VIN plates, and I want the title. The thief could then graft the VIN plates from the salvage car onto the stolen one, presenting the stolen car as if it's the wreck after a rebuild. That way, the stolen car gets a new title under the swapped VIN number, which allows it to be legally sold and registered. In other words, it's fraud. The shadow of Ben Lomond Peak stretched out across the horse pastures of the Ogden Valley. The North Fork of the Ogden River babbled through the pastoral town of Liberty on its way down toward Pine View Reservoir. To the north, the last light of day lifted from the slopes of the Powder Mountain Ski Resort and the mountains around it. Doug Lovell had grown up hunting those hills. So on this evening, May 5th, 1985, he sat in familiar surroundings as the sky slid through the lavender hues of twilight. Doug and his friend Billy Jack sat in a parked Volkswagen. They were hunting, but not for deer. Instead, they watched as the lights came on in the windows of the farmhouses. One house caught Doug's eye. It remained dark. The house belonged to Cody and Karen Montgomery, a couple with deep family roots in the Ogden Valley. I know we had just built our home and we'd been there maybe two years. That afternoon, Cody and Karen had taken their kids, including Jessica, Cody Jr., and Chad, to visit a relative. We were going to go down to Cody's grandma's just down the road and get a haircut. Jessica was then six going on seven and wasn't all that interested in tagging along with her little brothers. She just wanted to stay home and read her book. That's Karen, by the way. She convinced her daughter it was better to come than stay home alone, and the Montgomerys headed up the dirt road. It's the, just across the field. You mm -hmm. could see it from the field. 
you know, just walking distance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very close. But far enough for Doug. He and Billy Jack crept from the Volkswagen toward the open garage door. We had left the garage door open because there's nobody up here. And hit pay dirt almost immediately. Cody Sr. had left a gun against the wall of the mudroom. Doug snatched it. It's a four-level split, and the garage was open, so the door that he went into came in from the garage, and that was kind of a mudroom. And then next to the mudroom was the washroom, the laundry room, and then there was a basement right there. Doug and Billy Jack spotted more guns in the basement. Cody Sr. was storing his father-in-law Ted Hillstead's collection of rifles and shotguns there. There was no door to the basement, so you could just see right in the basement. And they were just at the back. Yeah, it probably wasn't too hard to find. No, it wasn't. (laughs) The Montgomery family returned home around 10 p.m. As Cody Sr. steered into the gravel driveway, his headlights swept across a shell belt, a piece of hunting gear that holds shotgun shells. Doug, or maybe Billy Jack, had dropped it on the way out of the house. You guys knew right when we got there that something was yeah. off. Yeah. Dad knew because yeah, that the thing. the bullet and then... belt was out. Cody Sr. put the car in park and told his children to stay put. Because we had to stay in the car, yeah. right? And then Dad went through the whole house and crawled up in the attic and everything. Like, checked the whole, every corner of the house out before he'd let us in. Karen followed her husband through the house. She could see someone had ransacked the master bedroom. I went in my bedroom and I could tell that my five-gallon jar of change was gone and our drawers had been gone through. Far-flung and sparsely populated Liberty was not one of the most active areas for crime in Weber County. Response times were slow. Cody and Karen did a more detailed sweep while they waited for a sheriff's deputy to arrive. We started looking around and went downstairs and noticed that the guns were gone and some other things were missing from downstairs. The deputy made a list of the missing guns. There were seven in total, four shotguns and three rifles. I mean, after they told us, you probably won't see the guns again and just, you know, we'll keep you informed if there's anything that happens, comes of it. Cody and Karen Montgomery wouldn't hear anything more about these missing guns for years. Doug and Billy Jack came away from that theft with more guns than they needed. The following weekend over Mother's Day, Doug, Rhonda, and Billy Jack made a road trip out to Utah's West Desert. They went out past Calio, a small farming community along the old Pony Express Trail. To an old homesteader's cabin, Doug knew about from hunting trips to the Deep Creek Mountains along the Utah-Nevada border. They dug a hole just out back of the cabin and buried several of the guns. They had left one at home, a Winchester 1200. They were driving back home and were about halfway back when, near the city of Nephi, Doug pulled to the side of the highway to allow Billy Jack to empty his bladder. A Utah Highway Patrol trooper took notice, stopped, and arrested Doug on suspicion of driving under the influence. Billy Jack ended up in the drunk tank as well, leaving Rhonda to bail them both out of jail. Word of this DUI arrest did not get back to Bill Holthouse. Nephi sits about 100 miles to the south of Clearfield, and in 85, Even police agencies next door to one another in Utah struggled to communicate. At that time, uh, we couldn't talk to Ogden. We couldn't talk to any of those other places, except on one frequency. It was called statewide, and you only ever use that for emergencies. Doug and Billy Jack returned to Rhonda's apartment after she bailed them out and reunited with the stolen Winchester. Billy Jack took a hacksaw and chopped it to make the weapon easier to conceal and use at close range. Getting caught with that illegally modified short-barrel shotgun would likely land Billy Jack in federal prison. 
he certainly could not just carry the Winchester down the street to Joyce's apartment. He needed to conceal it. So he fished a long, rectangular box, which had originally held fluorescent light tubes, out of a garbage can. Doug provided Billy Jack with an outline of the plot. He would go visit his dad in the evening, giving himself an alibi. Billy Jack, meantime, would walk up Washington Boulevard with the Winchester. They scouted out Joyce's fourplex. Doug showed Billy Jack where she parked at night. They even stalked her to work one day, following her 40 miles south into the Salt Lake Valley. Doug bought a box of shotgun shells while down there. He gave Billy Jack a handful to take with him on the agreed-upon night. Dusk was coming on when Billy Jack set out with his fluorescent light box. He walked to Joyce's apartment and took up position behind some bushes across the street. He could see Joyce wasn't home. Her Oldsmobile was absent from the carport. So he settled in and waited, drinking beer after beer, the Winchester close at hand. The hands of the clock spun round. Billy Jack at last asked himself if it was worth it. He decided he couldn't do it. He grabbed the box, heavy with its payload of blue steel, stood and started walking back the way he had come. He had gone about two blocks to the west when, in line of sight of South Ogden Police Headquarters, he ducked into a patch of trees. He found some soft ground beneath a large pine tree and dug into it with his gloved hands. The Winchester went into the hole, along with the shotgun shells and the gloves. Doug was not happy when he came home from his dad's house and discovered the hit had not happened. Billy Jack said it wasn't his fault. Joyce had never arrived home. Doug told Billy Jack he needed to try again. They scouted Joyce's apartment once more, and Doug gave Billy Jack $50, a down payment on the five grand that was to come. Billy Jack told Doug he would take care of it. Then he used the money to get drunk, and over Memorial Day weekend, he packed his things, thumbed a ride, and hitchhiked his way out of town. Doug's arrest for DUI on the way back from burying the guns put him in a bind. If word of it got back to his bosses at the Ideal Cement Company, he would lose his job. Hardly a day had passed since Billy Jack's disappearing act at the end of May before Doug came up with a plan. He went to work and, while there, claimed to have tweaked his back. The injury, if there even was one, was not serious, but Doug filed for workers' compensation. He went in for a medical exam and exaggerated the severity of his pain. The doctor prescribed muscle relaxers, which he took. Doug then went to another doctor, under the guise of seeking a second opinion, and then another. He collected scripts for Percodan, Percocet, and Valium. He took those too. In fact, so great was his phantom pain that he received more muscle relaxers and even Halcyon to help him sleep at night. Doug consumed those pills at sometimes two to three times the prescribed dosage, not because he was in pain, but because he had become addicted. At the start of June, Doug's mind turned to another man he believed capable of killing Joyce, Tom Peters. Doug had met Tom at the Utah State Prison in 79. Tom had had a reputation there as a bruiser, a so-called debt collector. He had done time in maximum security prisons in both California and Colorado. Tom was also acquainted with Doug's accomplices from the robbery at the USAVE market, Cheryl Chestnut and Ray Dodge. Because of his, when Doug 
first got Welsh to get was from rivalry with uh, some of the older, rougher guys around Salt Lake. I'm not from Salt Lake, but as I came into time here, I got to know of Tom had lived with Doug and Rhonda for a time after getting out of prison. Tom had actually had a wife then, but wasn't welcome to live with her because he also had a series of girlfriends. Tom would later tell police he and Doug spent those weeks in 83 carrying out a string of petty burglaries. It was like a gas barbecue pit and stuff. On somebody's front porch, or not porch, it was a garage thing. By the spring of 85, Tom had moved in with Becky, one of those girlfriends, on the west side of the Salt Lake Valley. Doug called Tom at Becky's place and told him he needed help taking care of a woman. He was willing to pay to make it happen. Tom's ears perked up at the mention of money. Because I told him, I said, I was, because I don't, I see, that's the problem that don't, you just don't, money's, I, I handle hundreds and hundreds of dollars all the time. Schemes, scams. Tom had a nasty heroin habit. Doug and Rhonda drove down to visit Tom at Becky's apartment. He was even on Perkadans, I've been mean, a guy. And he was a totally different person than uh, I've seen before. And so was Rhonda. She was a totally different lady. I know her very sweet. Tom hadn't known Doug to use drugs before, but found him now angry and erratic. See, when he first come to see me, he had a big scar down his cheek, you know. And he said, this woman saying he's raped, that he raped and he's all wild, you know. Doug was due in court in just days, on June 12th, for a preliminary hearing. He wanted Joyce gone before she could testify. He had a fresh workers' compensation check for $800. It was Tom's, if he wanted it, as a down payment. Becky was sat there, Rhonda, right on the couch, Rhonda, and uh, Doug and me. And they were up tight because of money. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm, trying, I'm trying to make some promises. Tom told Doug he would do it. Tom didn't intend to carry out the hit, though. He just saw it as an opportunity to secure his next fix. I only got some dope, is all I got. Like, I'm just a dope fiend. That's all I was then. It's a street dope fiend. But I would lie to anybody for the dope. Tom talked it over with his girlfriend, Becky, after Doug and Rhonda left. They hatched a plan. Tom would take the money use half of it to buy heroin, and then take the other half to Las Vegas or Wendover. He would gamble it, double it back to the original amount, then return the $800 to Doug and say, sorry, can't do it. Tom drove up to Ogden a few days later. He met up with Doug near the Utah State Employees Credit Union branch on 42nd Street and Harrison Boulevard, where Rhonda did her banking. He was trying to cash the check, too. Next, they rolled down 40th Street to scope out Joyce's apartment. Doug and Rhonda had already gone and cased Joyce's apartment themselves. On one of those trips, Doug had discovered the back window on the east side of Joyce's unit did not latch tight. He could slide it open from the outside. And then he said, he said, you can go to a window, and he said, it's a window open. I'll just go up to the door, you know, I just, you know, blow the your way in, you know, and pack your stuff, and pack your stuff, and I'd like to disappear. Tom understood Doug wanted him to make it appear as though she had skipped town. Doug said to take Joyce up in the mountains. They agreed on a date. Doug knew his family would be gathered at his dad's cabin on this particular night. He arranged to be there with Rhonda to provide an alibi. Once at the cabin, Doug kept flipping on a portable AM radio so he could listen to the hourly news. He expected to hear something about a murder in South Ogden. That news report never came. Tom Peters had purchased a gram of heroin with the money and headed to Nevada to gamble the rest. His plan to double the money failed. 
Well, the only thing he did tell me when he came over, when he, when that wasn't done, when he said he come by a couple times, that wasn't done, but I already, I didn't win in the big, I didn't win, you know, the story. <laughs> I didn't double his money and come back and give him money. I spent it all and we partied and got dope. And anyway, he come over a couple times, so what's happening? Well, the money's already gone. And he, and he did say, well, yeah, it's going to be done if I can do it myself. It's going to be done. So. Joyce Yost went to court on June 12, 1985. The preliminary hearing was an opportunity for a judge to review the evidence and decide if it was enough to advance the case to arraignment, where Doug would enter a plea. Detective Bill Holthouse had no doubt it would be. It was very, very good evidence. Joyce and Bill were the only two witnesses called to testify at the prelim by the prosecutor Brian Namba. It was a pretty serious case for an attorney with as little experience as I had. It was probably the most serious case that I'd had up to that point. Brian was just a few years out of law school. He'd only been at the Davis County Attorney's Office for about a year. Doug also had an attorney, one who was much more seasoned, John Hutchison. John was a very colorful guy. Hutch, as people called him, had a bit of a reputation. I think that his rough exterior was intimidating to young attorneys. When I first met him, you know, I was somewhat intimidated by him. John often showed up to court in moccasins and a Nehru jacket. He had long hair. You know, he was sort of a hippie in the early years that he refused to wear a necktie and had wore beads and things like that when when he went to court. Uh, But an Excellent attorney, an excellent legal mind. He rarely advised his clients to waive their right to a preliminary hearing. The defense attorney can use the preliminary hearing as a tool of discovery to find out what the witness is going to say, to limit what the witness can say when they get to to trial, and to help them to be able to prepare some sort of a defense. That's how Joyce came to sit on the witness stand on that June day. It was the first time she had seen Doug since the night of the rape. I went with her. I didn't go into the courtroom, though, but I was there with her. That's Joyce's daughter, Kim Salazar. She and her husband, Randy, had turned out to support Joyce. I do remember her. We're saying she didn't want to get on the stand because I believe Doug, Doug told her if she told anybody, he promised he'd come back and kill her. But I was just trying to tell her that I love her and I, man, and I stood behind her and, you know, that's what she was afraid of. Joyce had not revealed the rape to her son, Greg Roberts, who was at the time attending dental school in Virginia until the time of this court hearing. Maybe that's why she called me and told me. Joyce hadn't wanted what had happened to interfere with Greg's studies. Yeah, I think I got a muted story for sure from her. She didn't really let on much and that everything that was going on surrounding it. Joyce had been more candid with Mel Roberts, her ex-husband. She was concerned about going forward with it, with charges. And I said, you know, you owe it to yourself and to Kim and Greg to, to hang that son of a bitch. She had told Mel she feared having her private life dissected in public. You know, she was prepared to be drugged through the mud because you know they're going to. And I said, you just have to tell you with a grain of salt. And when you know it's not true. Bill Holthouse listened to her testimony. I remember that it basically went to script. I mean, uh, Brian asked the questions that were in my police report. She portrayed a really nice image. She, She was very likable. But I think she was embarrassed about the whole thing. She didn't really relish the thought of of testifying. And so she did leave 
some things out. He walked her step by step through the story. Her responses were not as detailed as they had been the night of, but they were consistent. That is, until Brian asked if the assault had included anything other than, quote, normal sex. Joyce said no. Brian had read the reports. He knew what Doug had forced Joyce to do. When she wouldn't say it voluntarily, the tightrope as a prosecutor to have to walk is that you're not allowed to ask leading questions of your own witness. Joyce couldn't bring herself to talk about it in open court. So when she didn't volunteer it, I had to try to figure out ways to ask the question using different words, but without leading her, and and that was kind of difficult. Brian tried to rephrase. John objected, but was overruled. Uh, The judge kept giving me a chance because he knew what was in the probable cause statement on the information, uh, but she just wouldn't say it. This was a blow to the state's case, but not a fatal one. John took his turn questioning Joyce. Hadn't she offered to go have coffee with Doug? How had she identified his car if she hadn't seen its license plate? Mr. Lovell's attorney um, attempted to trip her up on a couple, three things. It didn't work. The point of greatest substance in John's questioning revolved around the medical exam Joyce had undergone, what's known as a rape kit. The doctor's and nurse's notes, along with the forensics gathered during that exam, had been passed to the police, prosecution, and defense. They had become part of the record of the case. However, that's not the same thing as being public. I will again acknowledge here, as I did last episode, that Joyce is not able to provide consent for release of this information. I have personally reviewed the rape kit records, but am only revealing a sliver of what they say in this forum because they are factually relevant and were discussed in open court. Defense attorney John Hutchison asked Joyce if she knew whether or not the doctor had observed any vaginal tearing, a possible indicator of forcible sex. Joyce replied, she didn't know. The doctor's report didn't mention any vaginal tearing. But then, remember, Joyce had cooperated with her attacker following the initial barrage in her car. Because I was taking a certain amount of physical abuse along with this and uh, decided to cooperate. So the absence of those other injuries was not unexpected. There was another issue with the rape kit evidence. The crime lab had tested oral and vaginal swabs collected from Joyce. The vaginal swab contained traces of seminal fluid. The oral, however, did not. That meant the state had no physical evidence to support the sodomy charge. There is a good reason why that swab came back negative. The doctor's notes stated while Joyce hadn't showered following her assault, She had taken a drink of water. These two factors, Joyce's reluctance to testify to the sodomy and the lack of supporting evidence, led to the judge dismissing the sodomy count. But she held up well during preliminary, other than there were some things she didn't want to talk about. Joyce left the hearing recognizing her reluctance had hurt the prosecution's case. She knew that there was things that she didn't say that she probably should have said, but she was ashamed, and she wouldn't say it. It was her nightmare scenario, like the scenes in that TV movie she had watched, A Case of Rape. Yet she had faced it. Kim's husband Randy said his mother-in-law had shown tremendous courage. This man had ruined her life and her kid's life, and, and you know what? She wasn't scared of me anymore. She was telling the truth. And everything you told me that, that you were gonna kill me, well, f*** you. You know what? You're going to prison for what you did to me. As for Doug, he would remain free on bond, at least until his arraignment hearing, on June 20th.
John Hutchison showed up in court on June 20th without his client. Doug, he said, was unavailable and incapacitated by a back injury. The story of the back injury had taken on a life of its own. Doug now had crutches and doctor's notes aplenty. Bill Holthouse thought it was all baloney. Never saw any indication there was anything wrong with his health at all. He was thin to begin with. He wasn't a heavy kid. Actually, you know, I thought of him as being in pretty good shape. John asked the judge to postpone the arraignment. The judge agreed to a one-week delay. Doug was not convalescing at home. He had taken Rhonda's car that day, driven up to a mountain reservoir called East Canyon, and spent time drinking beer and boating. When Doug had returned home that evening, Rhonda had discovered he had smashed up her car while driving intoxicated. I'm going to kill Joyce Yost, Rhonda would later say he told her. Later that night, police received a 911 call from a man who lived in the same apartment complex as Doug and Rhonda. He had seen a blue pickup truck crash into a parked flatbed in the parking lot of the Lake Park Apartments. Those apartments sit on the west side of U.S. Highway 89. The road, which also goes by the name Washington Boulevard, is one of the primary north-south arteries of Utah's Weber Valley. And it serves as the dividing line between the communities of South Ogden to the east, where Joyce lived, and Washington Terrace to the west. Because the 911 call came from a location just a hundred or so feet, on the west side of that dividing line, the dispatcher sent out an officer from Washington Terrace. Officer T.J. Harper received the information at about 11 p.m. He drove his patrol car over to the complex and spotted the blue Ford pickup truck turning northbound onto Washington Boulevard. He radioed for backup and pulled the truck over. Harper would write in his official report, he noted the smell of alcohol as he approached the truck. How much have you had to drink tonight? Harper asked. A couple of beers, came the reply. Did you hit another vehicle back there at the Lake Park Apartments? He asked. Nah, but some guy says I did, the driver said. Harper told the driver, Doug Lovell, he appeared to be intoxicated and would have to take a field sobriety test. A couple more patrol cars showed up about this time. They had come not from South Ogden, but instead from the city of Riverdale, even farther to the west. Officer Harper put Doug through a few quick tests, which Doug failed. He then placed Doug under arrest. The two Riverdale officers began the process of impounding the pickup truck. Officer Steve Hallowell took a look inside the cab. He spotted a handgun under the driver's seat, a Beretta Model 950 BS, also known as the Minx. This tiny semi-automatic pocket pistol fired 22 caliber short rounds. What it lacked in punch, it made up for in sheer sneakiness. Hallowell slid the magazine out of the gun. There were six rounds in the clip, as well as one in the chamber, ready to fire. State and federal law prohibited Doug from possessing firearms, let alone a loaded concealed handgun while intoxicated and leaving the scene of an accident. This was, at very least, a violation of the terms of his pretrial release in the rape case. What none of the officers seemed to realize that night was Doug had skipped court earlier that same day. At that time, there was very little communication between Davis County and Weaver County. We didn't have the same radio frequencies. The Washington Terrace and Riverdale officers apparently did not know Doug stood accused of a kidnapping and rape. They didn't piece together. He had been headed toward Joyce's apartment when they had stopped him and found the little mouse gun. And once again, no one 
bothered to tell Clearfield Police Detective Bill Holthouse. So I, I doubt they even really knew much about our case at that time. And I didn't know anything about the DUI up there at all. Or Davis County Prosecutor Brian Namba. You you didn't have a lot of intelligence going on from one person to the other, one agency to the other. Had someone with knowledge of the Joyce Yost case been involved in or informed of this DUI arrest, they might have realized he was on his way to Joyce's apartment to kill her. The county sheriff, they had enough cars that they would have briefings when they had shift change. But the smaller agencies, it's just one officer turning over the keys to the other officer and saying, well, this is what happened tonight. It was after midnight when Officer Harper booked Doug on suspicion of DUI, leaving the scene of an accident, carrying a concealed weapon, and illegal possession of a firearm by a restricted person. Prosecutors in Weber County filed formal charges later that same day. Again, no one bothered to communicate this to Brian Namba, the prosecutor handling the rape case in neighboring Davis County. You know, they didn't have a lot of computer communication going on in those days. Just paper, and they probably just never found out about it. So it was that Doug Lovell, an ex-con with a history of violence, who was out of jail on bond while awaiting trial for rape, who police had caught with a loaded firearm, was allowed to bail out of jail. Again. And Joyce had no idea about any of it. One week later, on June 26th, Doug went before Utah 2nd District Court Judge Rodney Page for his arraignment in the rape case. The purpose of arraignment is for the defendant to just declare whether he's guilty or not guilty. He pleaded not guilty to all charges. He would have heard what the evidence is against him at the preliminary hearing, And when he declares that he's not guilty, then that sets the stage for us to set trial. Judge Page scheduled the trial for August 20th. Brian Namba asked the judge to compel Doug to provide blood, hair, and saliva samples to be used in forensic tests. Doug's attorney objected, but Judge Page issued an order to make it so. Judge Page also signed what's known as a hold order. I have a copy of this document. It reads, quote, The defendant is ordered held until further notice of this court. Clear language from the judge saying, Keep this guy locked up until I say otherwise. A week and a half later, on July 8th, the situation with the stolen Mazda came to a head. Salt Lake City Police Detective Ron Greenleaf had obtained an arrest warrant. Possession of a stolen vehicle. There were two separate charges, one for the Mazda RX-7 and the other for the Toyota pickup. Ron drove up from Salt Lake late that afternoon and arrested Doug. He was very talkative, but not. Didn't give me one iota of information regarding this case or the stolen vehicles. It was just like, you know, how's the weather? Gee, this is fun. You know, haven't been outside for a while. Wish I wasn't in handcuffs. (laughs) They arrived at the Salt Lake County Jail. Ron walked Doug in through the sally port. He then hung around, waiting and watching, as Doug went through the booking process. That didn't finish until a little after midnight. He just said, I guess I'll be seeing you, huh, in court. And I said, yes, you will. Ron didn't see Doug in court. Jail records show staff there let Doug walk at 1.45 a.m. on July 9th, a little over one hour after he was booked. This even though the felony car theft charges would have been more than enough for a judge to revoke his bail in the rape case. Meantime, 
The Davis County Attorney's Office was trying to find Doug to serve the court order demanding he provide blood and hair samples. He wasn't in the county jail where, according to Judge Page's hold order, he was supposed to be. Detective Bill Holthouse went to work tracking him down. Bill went to Doug and Rhonda's apartment in Washington Terrace on July 17th. He knocked on the door and was surprised when Doug answered. Bill figured in that moment that the hold order must have been rescinded. He told Doug they needed to go to the hospital for the blood draw. Doug said, hmm, wasn't a good time. He was babysitting his wife Rhonda's then four-year-old daughter, Alicia. The mother was not there. Rhonda worked for the state at an office in downtown Ogden and was gone during the day. Maybe Bill could come back another time, Doug suggested. I was not willing to come back another time. So I told him that we can take the daughter with us. Doug and Alicia piled into Bill's police car. They drove around Hill Air Force Base to a hospital in the city of Layton for the blood draw. On the drive back, Bill took a route that went past the base's south gate. At that time, there was a large, uh, there was F-105 on a stanchion, which was there for everybody to see. And the young, the young girl made a comment about the airplane. Bill asked Alicia if she would like to see the plane up close, an offer she eagerly accepted. This was not her fault, you know, that we were in this situation. So I stopped to show her the airplane. As Alicia looked wide-eyed at the sleek jet, Doug and Bill began to talk. We had a conversation about the case, and, and, and Douglas said something to me about this isn't going to trial. And, you know, this is, nothing's going to come out of this. And I said, I believe it is. I believe we have the evidence for it to go to trial. He looked at me with an expression that got my attention. Bill did not startle easily. It just was like it froze the moment. The two men looked each other in the eyes. Bill saw an intensity in Doug's expression that he still, to this day, struggles to put into words. And uh, he said, this will not go to trial. An odd thing for Doug to say, considering a trial date had already been scheduled. It was just a month away simply said, you know, with the young girl there, I didn't want to get into a, you know, a, a shouting contest. I said, I believe it will, and I let it go with that. The exchange left Bill troubled. That uh, led me to believe that he could become violent. He reported this concern up his chain of command. I did mention that to the attorneys following that, and I did mention that to South Ogden at that time. He told Joyce about it as well, and urged her to go stay someplace safe. I think she, she believed that she was able to take care of herself. Joyce did not heed this advice. She declined urgent invitations to stay with her daughter Kim and Kim's husband Randy. She had to have some fear. She had to have, but she didn't ever let on that she was afraid. Randy did not realize the latch on one of Joyce's apartment windows was broken. You could just slide it open. Even from the outside. If I would have known that, I would have. I mean, I would have put that. I mean, I never even heard of it. Doug Lovell was well aware. The heat of the afternoon struck Joyce Yost as she followed her daughter Kim to the parking lot outside Royal Studio a photography business in Ogden where Kim worked. It was Saturday, August 10th, 1985. Joyce had just taken a job at the studio as well, having quit her position selling fur for the Weinstock's department store. The pay was better and her commute was only four miles instead of 40. Kim's shift at the photo studio ended earlier than her mother's on that hot summer Saturday. I always got off early on Saturdays. We only worked until like noon. Um, she stayed there all day. So she walked me out. And I remember I had actually thought about asking her if she would watch the kids that night because we were going to go somewhere. 
but then she told me that they were going to go out to the base to listen to Steve play in the band. And so I never, you know, asked her to babysit the kids. Steve was the adult son of Joyce's close friends, Gordon and Terry Kaufman. Joyce also had made plans for the following day. A guy friend she had been seeing, John Gibson, was coming over to barbecue. Joyce finished her shift later that Saturday afternoon and went out to her car. It wasn't the big Oldsmobile anymore. She had sold that days earlier and in its place purchased a white 1976 Chevy Nova. She went home, changed into a pink dress, then drove the Nova over to her sister Dorothy's house on Fern Street in Clearfield. Dorothy later described the events of this night in a police interview. She drove uh, to, to my place and we got in, in my car and went to the officer's car. Joyce told Dorothy she had sold the Oldsmobile. The check she had received from the buyer was in her purse. Joyce and Dorothy carpooled to the club together, leaving the Nova parked outside Dorothy's house. Well, you see, uh, my car has a sticker and, and she, they sticker and hers didn't, and it was just easier to do it that way. They spent the next several hours socializing, dancing, and listening to the band. They liked us as long as we weren't too loud and people could get out and dance on the dance floor. They'd have a good time. They'd dance on almost every song. Steve Kaufman, the front man, had put the group together years earlier in 1964. Started in eighth grade at uh, Mount Ogden Junior High School. And basically it was a way to get girls to like you. The band is still together today under the name Outrageous. But in 85, they were called Still Rain. We opened for everybody from the Monkees to Jan and Dean, Johnny Rivers, Tommy James and the Shondells, um, uh, Three Dog Night, uh, all kinds of different, different groups, Mamas and the Papas. Still Rain had flirted with going big time in the mid 70s, but here a decade later, they mostly just gigged on the weekends. The Officers Club at Hill was a regular venue. Uh, the club had a big bar, and uh, those, those guys in the Air Force, uh, so these were all officers and their wives and their friends. The O Club often booked Still Rain on back-to-back -back nights, Friday and Saturday, for four hours each night. Yeah, I don't know how I did that, but I didn't know any better. I mean, you know. And that's all I, I was a rock and roll guy. Did, music was everything. Joyce was only five years older than Steve, but he remembered thinking she must have been even older since she socialized with his parents. My parents lived at a place called The Apartments, which was over by the, the old McKay D Hospital. And it was kind of a, a big, fancy new complex, and it had a wonderful outdoor pool. And every Sunday, that's where a lot of people had church <laughs> at that pool <laughs> for those who weren't going to one. And Joyce was always over there hanging out. It had been a while since Joyce had been over to the Kaufmans. Terry kept hoping to catch up with her, but they were seated on opposite ends of the table they weren't able to chat from that distance over the noise of the band. Joyce and Dorothy danced their last dances as the clock approached midnight. They said their goodbyes as the band wound down their final set. Then the two sisters went out to Dorothy's car and drove back across the freeway into Clearfield. The weather had turned while they had been at the club. Yes, it was very nice uh, when we went out there. It was, it was warm, it was hot. But uh, when we left to come home, which I think was about midnight, it had turned real cold and windy. Joyce, in her pink dress, was not prepared to stand out in the icy wind chatting with her sister. We, we said goodnight out in, in the driveway and see you later. And she got in her car and left, and I went into my house. Joyce drove to her apartment, where she parked the Nova in the carport. She went inside 
changed out of her dress, flipped on the little TV on her dresser, and settled down to bed. The Kaufmans had remained at the officers' club a little while longer to talk with their son. Because my parents were very supportive and they would often bring um, friends and stuff to Harrison would come, come hear the band. They liked hearing the band. Gordon and Terry didn't leave the club until a bit after midnight. Their route home took them past Joyce's apartment sometime between 12.30 and 1 a.m. Terry noticed light in Joyce's kitchen window, suggesting she might still be awake. She turned to her husband, who was driving, with a suggestion. Let's stop and talk to Joyce. I didn't get a chance to talk to her too much tonight because she was sitting down at the other end of the table and I hadn't seen her for or maybe a couple of months to talk to her. And let's just visit with her and find out how she's doing. And he looked at his clock and thought it was around, I think he said it was around 12.30 or 20 after 12. And it's kind of late. We were going into Salt Lake the next day. So he said, let's, let's wait and do it maybe tomorrow or the next night. We'll come down and talk to her and visit with her. And I noticed the light on in her kitchen. That's why I suggested uh, maybe stopping because I knew that she was still up. they didn't stop. If they had, Joyce might still be alive today. If you or someone you know has endured rape, sexual assault, or sexual abuse of any kind, help is available. In the United States, you can call 1-800-656-HOPE or visit rainn.org to connect with free resources through the Rape Abuse and Incest National Network. No one needs suffer in silence. You are not alone. If you haven't already, Please subscribe to or follow Cold to make sure you get every episode. You can also interact with me and the Cold team on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Cold Podcast. Cold is researched and written by Dave Colley, with editorial oversight by executive producer Cheryl Worsley. Additional executive producers include Paul Anderson, Nick Pinella, and Andrew Greenwood. Audio production by Nina Ernest. Mixing by Trent Sell. Michael Bonmiller composed the main score. Special thanks to the team at Amazon Music. Full credits for each episode are available at thecoldpodcast.com. Cold is an Amazon original by KSL Podcasts in association with Workhouse Media. Thank you for listening. <laughs>